Hello, everyone. This is Lee Andres from Akathame. And uh, today is another Live with Lee. And again, two heavy hitters. We've got Joe Sokol and Indy Young, who are going to get to introduce themselves. They are both household names in the UX community around the globe. And we're going to be talking about um, what is going to be a very interesting conversation around empathy. And I asked the question during uh, a broadcast that Joe and I had last week, can empathy be taught? He's like, of course it can. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been doing some research and we brought the um, brought Indy Young in to uh, all help us out with, uh, you know, defining what is empathy and what can be taught and, and who can be taught as well. So we'll have this conversation and how does it fit into user experience. If you are live, you are either joining us through LinkedIn or YouTube, please put your comments in either location. I will pick them up along the way. As you all know, 30 minutes goes by very fast, so we're gonna get right into it. So Indy, welcome. Thank you. And Joe, welcome to you, and thank you both for being here. I am honored and humbled uh, to have you both. So let's start off with the first question. What what do we mean when we talk about empathy? What What do you mean by that? Can I field that one? Go for you, it. You should. Uh, it, 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 just as also as a quick background, uh, mm -hmm. again, great to see everybody. But again, you know, it, it, we would be remiss if we didn't mention. Come on, Indy, you wrote the book on practical empathy for the UX. <laughs> In fact, for the you UX even field. That. <laughs> I did. <laughs> and so that's why, I really, uh, you know, I, I, yeah. as a catalyst for this conversation, glad to to have have been involved in that but you know honestly you're absolutely the person who should be who should define that so thank you ah, thank you <laughs> and right. uh, yeah the book um is really focused at um i wrote it with the idea that someone who's a developer someone who's a product manager someone who is a user experience person uh can actually apply empathy now the the key point is that when people toss that word around empathy, everybody has a different idea of what it means. It's like the blind men with the elephant. Um, it actually, in psychology, has eight to 12 different types. So when you say empathy, it can mean a lot of different things. Um, most often, I'll get the definition, people will make the assumption that it's, oh, I'm feeling your emotion. Um, like I see that you're uh, that you're angry, and so I can feel angry too. Or I I get your distress. That's called empathic distress, and the first one's called emotional contagion. So these are two things that um, people actually, even in the UX field, rail against. Don Norman has written a piece where he's all like, oh, "I don't think empathy is worth it. It's compassion," and I'm. A compassion is a type of empathy. Um, I actually have a medium piece that describes that. Um, so that's another definition of empathy. There's a Yale um, uh, professor who wrote a book called, um, his name is Paul Bloom. It's called Against Empathy, and he's talking about emotional contagion. Um, and these kinds of things where you're uh, trying to handle someone else's emotion, become uh, uh, exhausting, shall we say. It is, especially when you're handling somebody else's negative emotions, with respect to compassion, with respect to empathic distress, both of those are only about negative emotions. With compassion, you're trying to um, solve or support someone who's in a negative space. Um, there's also not just emotion involved, in empathy. So when you talk about something called cognitive empathy, you're, you're understanding, you're actually taking time in advance to understand different people's ways of thinking with their little inner voices. So their inner voices, their inner thinking, it's their guiding principles, how they're making their decisions, it's how they're handling their emotions and what those reactions actually are and what they do about what thinking it causes or what decisions it causes. So that's called cognitive empathy. And then there's another type of empathy that's called empathic listening. So if you guys know Dr. Brene Brown, she's pretty famous. She's done a lot of studies in shame and vulnerability. And she gives a talk where she defines empathy as empathic listening. And that has four steps to it. And I can teach you that. But I think I want to just say I gave you a great introduction to a whole bunch of different kinds of empathy. <laughs> mm. and, a, and a lot. So, so, yeah. with, so from both of your practices, and we'll start with 
Joe, I want to start with Joe. Given what we've just heard from Indy, where and because what, what I'm really hearing here is that we can teach people to be empathic or show empathy to a certain degree, right? Mm -hmm. So as I, as I saw in one of your posts, like a narcissist inside the organization will never be able to be taught, um, yeah, yeah. Empathy. They're just, they're, they're incapable. And I want to ask when you say that phrase, show empathy, what do you mean? Which of these 10 different types of empathy are we talking about? Um, most of the time when people say show empathy, they mean emotional contagion or some sort of response, an emotional response to somebody else's emotion. Um, so what does that really mean? I think yeah. that's what's important in our practice. I think it is. Uh, it, one of the problems is the, is how these words are used. It, mm -hmm. We talked about last week a little bit about you know the the word UX UI and how improperly that's used. Uh, <laughs> and sometimes we just have to move forward on this. But I think that that the biggest issue is how do we take time? How do we make sure that we take time to listen to what other people are saying and allow them to say the things that they do so that we can understand not how they feel to us, but how they feel in that in, in and of themselves, in their shoes, in their world, and that we can uh, avoid transference by transferring our feelings into their um, uh, situation or into that particular uh, yeah. issue. And the way, you know, when we talk about teaching empathy, I think it is cognitive empathy we really are talking about that has the most value, if you will, to- There's, there's two kinds, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, and it is that idea that we, um, th that we teach people to, to, uh, understand, to, to listen to other people, even if they don't even understand, at least to listen. And it is about valuation of other people and their, their statements, their, their guiding principles. I love that you talk about guiding principles in your book and your work, that idea, those things that are core to people that are mm -hmm. core to their being that they may not even realize when they express nuggets of information uh, through your interaction with them. And yeah. finally, it is about, I think from the teaching empathy, it's about teaching those of us in the, in the field to listen to what people are saying and not impose our own uh, core beliefs, our own guiding principles onto so, those other people. Yeah, I think especially now, in this period when we have all the protests about the killing of George Floyd, we have a little opportunity to really start paying attention to the fact that all of our software discriminates and all of the work that we do and all of our research is biased. We are not doing it properly. We're not taking the time to do it properly. We're going quickly and we're throwing our own perspective onto the way that we're making decisions about the digital services that we're providing. We're not thinking about other people's perspectives. We're not exploring and taking time to listen to people to hear how they go about approaching their purpose. Instead, we're simply focused on the solution space. We're not looking into the problem space, how people try to pursue their purpose. And we're not taking the time. So um, one of the things that I'm reading about what what defines white middle class uh you know way of thinking uh one of them is speed um and trying to get things done quickly and not taking the time um and i think that that's so baked into especially the ux world and the world of digital um that we need to really stop that that's well the wheel we need to stop indy can we go back up just a second you, mm -hmm. you said that our software is developed, designed, built with biases and prejudice. Mm -hmm. Can you give me an example of that? Absolutely. So Sarah Walker Bocher wrote a book called Technically Wrong with a ton of examples in it. Eric Meyer also wrote a book. Oh, yes. And Kathy O'Neill wrote a book, Weapons of Math Destruction. Joy Bwalami, who's a friend of Kathy O'Neill's, has just gotten her... Um, her paper presented at the, I think it's the Boston um, State City Hall about um, do facial recognition. So facial recognition is an easy one. It does not recognize uh, faces very well unless you're a white male. Um, 
there's tons of data about it. And this is why you're seeing right now, Microsoft saying, we're not going to sell facial recognition software anymore. IBM saying, we're not going to do facial recognition anymore. I, Amazon saying, oh, we're going to put a stop on it for like a year. Um, <laughs> so there's, um, there's also someone called Mark Hurst who runs a newsletter he calls, I think, Skeptech. Um, and he has a ton of examples in there. But to put it very simply, let's say you've got, oh, I don't know, a digital storefront where you're trying to help people purchase your product. You're creating that digital storefront with a average user in mind. Right. And Roman Mars did a great 99% um, invisible um, podcast about how it's mythical. There is no one person who's average. In his podcast, he brings up the well-known study about the Air Force way back when we were first inventing planes and um, how they're all like, well, how far away are we going to stick the the, um, the controls? So they measured all these people who were flying planes and they took the average size and they stuck the controls that far away and they had plane crash after plane crash. Turns out nobody could reach them. They were either too close or they were too far. And so then they invented adjustable seats. Okay, so this is our problem. We're still in that point where we're creating software like a storefront, even as simple as that, but more complex in, in enterprise software that's built for one way of thinking that doesn't actually exist. And it's based on re research that the team did um, quickly. And then they interpreted it using their own perspective without knowing it. So, um, pardon my dogs in the background. Thank you cool. for, uh, for a podcast. Um, so, what I'm what I'm hearing is that the challenge that user experience designers that are they're facing um, when they are being told that there's not enough money or there isn't enough interest to do extensive research or testing, the way that a user experience designer knows that it needs to be done, is that because the organization lacks empathy? It's because we, um, so you guys are all like, we're losing this, we're losing this in the beginning of uh, the intro. Um, I think one of the things we're losing is all the, the knowledge that we've built already about user experience. So people like Joe, people like me, um, we're trying, we're doing a lot of teaching now to try yeah. to not remake the same mistakes. But right. I think what's happened is we, it's not that you, you know, no one in, individually is responsible for it. But for some reason, we have caught on to these things like lean um, and agile and jobs to be done where it makes it into a machine approach, a process, a, a method that doesn't include the people and doesn't include the time to understand how a person's pursuing their purpose. So interesting. Sorry to interrupt. One of the things that I've I've been saying for years is that um, is that and it's we're we are in this position even more so is why is it that we always have time and money to do it over but never to do it right? Why right. do we see that we don't have time to listen to real people doing real things? And I use that phrase, it's a Don Norman quotation from an Interactions article he wrote in probably ninety nine. Right. Still yeah, you don't it's need still to true. talk to so many people, but they have to be real people. I do a lot of enterprise software. I love enterprise software. That's why, you know, UX for the rest of us is kind of my motto. I mean, I believe in that in my practice. And it's about experience for the rest of us, of us as real people. Enterprise software is where most people do most of their stuff, whether it's, you know, word processing or some spreadsheet or some order processing software or some uh, enterprise resource planning tool. That's where people spend most of their time in front of the glass, really. And so, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, and, and the problem is that uh, so many times we are told we don't have time to talk to someone or well, you can't see real people doing that, but we'll give you a subject matter expert or someone who right. used to be a, a person doing that with a, mm -hmm. a proxy person. And I think that's where we, 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 we break the ability to empathize with real people doing real things because we're not talking to the people doing the stuff. 
Yeah, I've been, I, I hope that this is a great wedge for us as people who are not empowered within the organization to actually say, hey, we're introducing bias hey, we're not supporting certain thinking styles here. Hey, we've got to think about, oh, you know, is our service discriminatory? Um, I just did some work with a, a really large firm um, who is at the forefront of being known for not discriminating with the people that they work for, and yet there's a ton of discrimination. So um, I actually do have a way of talking about it and I encourage people to start talking about it. Now's the little window that we can start talking about it. I think part of it though, is that yes, we're, we're disempowered. We don't have power in the organizations necessarily. So one of the ways to get power is to work at making relationships, at listening to the people who do have power over and over again, uh, repeatedly. And when you listen, there's a specific way, now this is called empathic listening. There's a specific way of doing it that builds trust over time. And then eventually that person will trust you in return. So let me define empathic listening because there's two types of empathy that I use in user experience. And empathic listening is what Joe was just talking about. Listening is the key. So when you say, the word empathy and you say show empathy, stop yourself, don't let those words come out of your mouth. Instead, talk about listening. I hate it that you know the heart is supposed to be the thing that represents empathy. It's really the ear or the eyes if you read lips or sign language. Um, it's understanding what a person's trying to tell you. I wish we had telepathy servers. That would make it even better because then we could hear what's going on in their minds. <laughs> but anyway, empathic listening has four steps. Okay, the very first step is for you to recognize another person has something going on. There is some pause, they're right. thinking, um, they're getting angry or quieter, right? These are the things that will happen, for example, with your peers in working sessions, in conference rooms, maybe with people who are even trying to do usability tests with you. Um, you have, uh, so this is when we were talking earlier, this is where um, some people don't have this ability to notice it, okay? To notice that there's something going on for someone else. That's something you have to train yourself into if you don't have that ability. Um, and there's a whole spectrum of people who don't have that ability. Um, Lee mentioned the narcissist <laughs> uh, definitely doesn't have that ability and doesn't quite have the ability to even recognize that they're lacking it. Um, sorry, narcissists. <laughs> but anyway, that's a special club, Andy. <laughs> uh, indeed, yes. <laughs> that's the first thing is to, to learn how to recognize that. Now, if you have um, a child who does not recognize that, you can start training them how to do that. The second step, and this is important for us as adults, um, is to recognize that that person has their own history. They have all their own experiences and all of that history and experiences has brought them to this moment to have these thoughts in their head and these emotions and it's valid. So you can't go judging somebody else in their situation. Oh, you shouldn't worry about that. That's, that's an evil thing to say, that's not listening. So that's the second step. The third step is to communicate to that person, hey, I see that something's going on for you. I'd love to hear more about it. Or after that meeting where you noticed it in somebody else, um, say to that person, hey, I feel like you weren't heard. I would love to hear you. I wanna give you the gift of feeling heard. Um, and right. that is your invitation to that person to talk to you. They may not take you up on that invitation. They may not take you up right then. It may be another week or something where, yeah, you know, okay, I'm gonna tell you what I was thinking there. And then as the fourth step is just, as you listen, stay out of judgment. Um, I teach a class on deep listening uh, and there as actually a ton more that you're doing while you're listening. Uh, but those are the four steps of empathic listening. But one of the things that I think is, is important as we're looking at that is, is time. Time is important, time, that it does take time to do this, that there are yeah. no in a lot yeah. of ways. And part yeah. of the problem is the reality of 
of enterprise and the reality of any enterprise, you know, large or small, is the ability to set goals and to have things that are not open ended. I think there is a way that, mm. that even within our 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 uh, practice, we can we can practice empathy as we use those. Uh, four steps, as you mentioned, is how do we make those, how do we operationalize those? And I think there are ways that we can do that effectively. Mm -hmm. We know that, uh, you know, uh, Tom Ralden and uh, uh, um, uh, with the, I, her approach to personas, uh, there's been a lot of work in, in that for many years, uh, scenarios, uh, scenario-based design has been a way to try to capture those mm -hmm aspects of people's behaviors so that we can design for them. Taking a, an approach to a, a practical, empathetic approach, I think is uh, is a different way of looking at, at getting to the same goal. And the same goal is creating products that, you know, whose conceptual model, using some Norman language again, conceptual model of the designer matches the conceptual model of the person who engages with that. Thing. Right. Yeah. And those conceptual models. Yeah. Sorry. I was going to say they can be different and you can switch conceptual. Like I call them thinking styles. Um, and the classic example that I use, and by the way, Lee, if you want to share that one screen, I have the four steps there. Um, just yeah. if people want to scribble that down. Um, but the classic example of thinking styles is if you're a passenger, um, there are four different thinking styles. I did a huge study with an airline. Um, and one of the thinking styles is engaged. I really like traveling places. I like uh, to meet people and see new places. And the, the, the mm -hmm. plane is interesting. The airport's interesting, right? And there's another one that's called just get me there. I've got stuff I've got to do before I go to the airport and stuff I need to get done or, or I need to get to that cruise ship right after I land. Um, and so it's like a bus in the air and it better work. <laughs> um, but you can imagine yourself um, being one type of thinking style on a business trip, but a different type of thinking style when you're taking your kid to Disneyland. And that's right? a context, absolutely. And that's, mm -hmm. You know, looking at Andrew Hinton's uh, context for use, you know, and uh, yeah. JJ Gibson approach to to embodied cognition. Again, all these intersections of how that context might shift uh, the person's reaction to uh, the product that is in front of them, the, the whatever that product is, and that's where it becomes important that uh, the products that we design have that flexibility, you know, ideally, to adjust to the person as opposed to forcing mm -hmm. them to adjust mm -hmm. the product. Amen. Yeah. Uh, Amen. We've, so we've been gonna, all these years. I yes. Wanna, yeah. I want to throw this question out here. I have been told on many occasions by user experience, uh, senior level people, that they judge for a living. That hmm. their, that they judge for a living. To me, this is like nails on a chalkboard. Hmm. And, and the reason being is that it concerns me that are we just because you can make a decision and you can have good judgment and you can judge whether or not you like something and you can even justify that and validate it with facts. That's what user experience designers do. They evaluate with facts based on whether something will or will not work. To me, that contradicts empathy that I think if from my experience of working with UX design in that practice, that these are some of the most empathetic people out there, that they, they really, their job is to work with the user, with the end user to figure out what's gonna be best for them. But the judgment factor really comes when it's presenting those solutions and ideas and outcomes to the business stakeholders. And yeah, so I'm wondering if there's a disconnect. I think that because as user experience professionals and as designers, you're so uh, embedded and enmeshed in the community that you serve, which is always the end user, but then you've got these business stakeholders who are not as personally tied to those end users. They just have this product that they've got to get out and sell. And their goal is to sell and grow revenue and increase brand. And so there's this middle piece that how does that user experience person train empathy for the end user? I've actually got a beautiful diagram that 
represents how that connects. <laughs> um, so, so the thing is, is that um, the selling is going to be a lot easier if the thing that you're making solves the purpose that the person's trying to uh, achieve. So here's the diagram. Over on the right is the solution space, which is where UX usually lives. You'll see, I just drew somebody else's dual, continuous dual track diagram there mm -hmm. um, with the product discovery and the product development sort of in parallel and feeding each other, okay? Where do those opportunities come from? They come from something called an opportunity backlog, which Jobs to Be Done has been trying to fill and Lean and Agile have been trying to fill. They've not been filling them correctly. They've been filling them mechanically. They, that opportunity backlog needs to be filled with a deeper understanding of the variety of people. So the variety of thinking styles, the variety of uh, different um, environments that they're in and abilities that they have, but also with a deep understanding of how they approach their purpose. So you can see over on the left is the problem space. We There are a ton of people who are spending time doing this, but I'd say there's only 1% of the orgs out there that have leadership that appreciate this yet. Um, the problem space is where we're going to see our way forward, how we're going to differentiate ourselves from the, co uh, the competitors without just like copying them and trying to like force our people to come up with a brilliant idea. Well, there's no coming up with brilliant ideas unless you truly understand what people's purposes are. Mm -hmm. And the purposes are not to use your software. So if you look at the top of this, in the solution space, that's where the user is. That's where we talk about a passenger or a client or a customer or a member or you know all those nouns that we use to represent someone who has a relationship to our organization. In the problem space, we're just talking about a person a person who has a purpose. So let's take, for example, um, insurance, okay? So with insurance, you have members probably as your user in the solution space, and you're looking at them through the lens of um, either onboarding them to protect them or uh, maybe possibly giving them money after an incident, okay? Sure. In the problem space, this has been a problem or a purpose since before insurance companies, which is, ah, something has happened and I want to get it back to the way it was before. I want to recover. I want to recover the house that got blown down in the tornado, or I want to um, uh, mend the, the carriage that I was riding in or my leg that got broken. Um, all of these kinds of things existed before insurance happened. So that's a purpose. Now, if we go in and try to understand what is going inside somebody's mind as they are, let's say, dealing with a near miss accident. I did that particular research, so I have some of those stories. Um, I do listening sessions with people in the problem space about their purpose of, you know, what went through your mind during this near miss accident and what comes out of it uh, can fall into this diagram here. It's called an opportunity map and thinking styles, which get laid on top of the opportunity map so that you can see then as you're going in where your gaps are, where your weaknesses are, you can start deciding more strategically and with greater depth where you want to prioritize. Let's focus in on this area where there's a lot of, um, there's a gap and there's a lot of discrimination happening above the line. Uh, and there's like three thinking styles and we're only supporting one of them. Mm -hmm. So let's try to do a better job here. As soon as you do a better job, people are gonna notice. They're not gonna need selling, <laughs> right? <laughs> It's a story to, to to base the foundation for which everything else will grow. Right. That's 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 the use case. You know, that's case studies, right? We we know that. So if we've got we've got about we've got about less than a minute to go. Just oh. very quickly, from your perspective, you've mm -hmm. got practitioners that are trying desperately to do exactly what you're talking about. Um, should they even try if leadership has their eyes closed to all this? Should they even waste their time or should they find a company that promotes it? Uh -huh. I have heard, 
Yeah, I, there are some people who have to leave and go find another company, but I've also heard of people doing this guerrilla style. They do it during their lunches every Monday, Wednesday, Friday kind of thing. They'll sneak into meetings with one of these uh, results um, and say, hey, but, right, we've got this opportunity over here and people will be blown away. I've heard these stories over and over again. Yeah. So that's possible if you've got the... Mm -hmm. um, the the armor right the mental armor for it <laughs> yeah you've got to have the caps to do that that's right yeah mm -hmm. you've got to it's a lot of resilience what do you think about that joe you no know, i do i i do think the the other thing is that you do have to be practical and and you know at some point you have to decide which windmills you want to tilt against right. and uh at some point it, it just may not be worth it at the same time, there is an ethical responsibility, mm -hmm. you, you know, and Lee and I have talked about this. The reason I got into this world from technical writing was I wanted to create better products. I wanted to create things that were better for people. In fact, Steve Jobs is insanely great the, the, that the, the, the matching of this works so well for people. There's an inherent good in that. And uh, the obverse of that is there's also an inherent evil is probably too strong a word, but misalignment or uh, misanthropy of not doing this, of of saying, of not being empathetic, of, of not mm -hmm. taking an empathetic approach to the people who will engage with the product space that you're trying to create and looking at them as, as humans, as real people. And so that your job, I think as a practitioner, our job as practitioners is to, is to continue to push for that through guerrilla approach, but also being able to say to leadership, mm -hmm. be honest with me, be honest with your team members and be honest with your customers. It's okay if you say we can't afford to do X, Y, and Z. I mean, because the best is the enemy of the good, right? We mm -hmm. know that. But you have to be honest with the, everybody in the chain, not just uh, people within the project team, but within the company, not just with the company, but with the customers, with the people. We can't get there. And I, I I think that honesty gets back to the idea of kindness we talked about last week. Honesty has a much better cachet than um, dark pattern uh, of persuasion. Right. Yeah. So um, my suggestion to candidates looking for work is ask the tough question to the hiring managers. Ask the one tough question to the hiring manager. What is the most important thing to you about this organization. And if the customer isn't part of that answer, think twice. <laughs> yeah. Think yeah. twice. Because if everything isn't customer driven, customer centric, and they're not touching base with the customer, then everything is internalized. It's very much internalized. Or they are going to do a lot of testing inside versus external with, with the end users. So it's what are the priorities, right? So thank you both for joining us. As always, that goes by so fast. <laughs> and, no, it does. Um, we may have to have another conversation about ethics and design because that's a whole other issue right now, uh, as we explored with Dana uh, the other week. So it mm -hmm. is, it's a huge issue. And for those of you who are interested, um, all of their, their books, their writings, their, they've got their own YouTube channels, both indie. I think, Joe, you do too. Do you have a YouTube or do you have online stuff? I, can't no, just, yeah, I reposit most things in in regular joe consulting.com and okay. uh twitter and, and other places uh you know as i always say i don't speak for my employer or glad to be working That's for good. gemini and i you know gotta you know give the right props up. Up. And but, Indy's got her own consulting practice. So mm -hmm. if you guys need Indy, you know where to find her. Again, thank you all very much for joining Live with Lee. And I will see you next week. If my guest could stay on the line for just a second, we'll say goodbye. Take care, everyone. <laughs>